episode of Token Punch Lunch. And of course, this is a variety show where you're going to get a variety of opinions on a variety of subjects. And uh, they are basically up to the segment contributors, what they would what would they would like to talk about and in what fashion. And I give them as much artistic control over that as possible. And I let them kind of make their own decisions. But I put it all together for you so that uh, we can be all in one place and it's easier for you to access. Uh, so we've got a pretty good episode set up for you. I say that every time because I like every episode that we put out. I like all the segment contributors and uh, uh, that's just that. So hopefully this will be an enjoyable experience. This will be something that you'll want to come back and watch in a couple weeks as well. So hey, in a few minutes we're going to get to it. And let's go ahead and get to it right now. Let's see. Hey everybody, it's Jay. And it's time to talk about your flare. On 15 pieces of flare, we're going to show you all some ways to spruce up that game room. Now I don't know if your guys' game group is anything like mine, but sometimes we have a hard time choosing what games to play, and most of the time we never pick the brand new games to play. So I thought up of a little bit of a way to alleviate that issue and help you choose what games to play, and make sure you get what games you really need to play played instead of just overlooking them. So let's check it out. All right, for this project, we're gonna need some 550 paracord. We're gonna need a hammer, some small nails, a paper and pen, and some mini clothes pins. Now to start, we're gonna need to remove the inner strands of the paracord. There's like seven individual strands inside one long length of paracord. So you're just gonna remove the outer shell and pull those inner strands out. And then just get one of those strands. Then on one of those strands, tie an overhand knot on one side. An overhand knot is just loop the string around and then loop it around itself and pull it through. Now, the nails you wanna use, you wanna get ones with a little bit of a head on. Now go ahead and nail both nails where you want the string to hang. Now put the knotted side of the line over one nail. Then get the length you need and then give yourself a little bit of slack and then tie another overhand knot on that side of the string. Once you have your overhand knot, go ahead and loop it onto the nail. Then you can cut off the excess string from both sides. Now you can start writing all of your games onto individual pieces of paper. Or you can just write whatever games you absolutely want to get played first down on paper. Now when you write this stuff down, you can go as far as you want with the detail. You can put player count, um, game length, anything that really matters to you and your group and whatever is applicable to you and your group, you can write that information down on the paper and then that way it might be easier for you to pick what games you want to play come game night. Now go ahead and clip all of your clothes pins onto your line. Now I'm kind of OCD, so I kind of had to have mine in a specific pattern but you can do it however you want. Now clip the games you want to get played next onto your line. Now I had to flare mine up a little bit, you know, because that's just who I am. So I printed off all my box art covers, cut them out, laminated them, and that's what I'm using. Then once you got all the games that you really want to get played next, like for me, it's just all my games on my shelf of shame, you can go ahead and pick what game you want next Pull that one down, put that one away, and then get to play in that game. Boom! There you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. Now, the way I thought up of doing this is in the restaurant industry, you have a ticketing system. So, like, when you write an order, you put it in a slide. Or, actually, some restaurants even do use a line and clip them on there just like this. But, that's pretty much it. Whatever orders need done, you do those orders, pull them down, throw the ticket away or spike it or whatever. And this is the same thing. Whatever games need played, you pull the game or you put the games up first of all that you want to get played. So if you want to play your shelf of shame games, only hang those games. If you want to play your favorite games, but make sure you get a good variety, hang those games. And then no matter what, when it's time to pick a game, you have to pick one of the games that are on that line, as long as it's applicable to your group and everything. But if anybody wants a tutorial or really just wants me to print them some of those um, box covers and laminated, 
shoot me a message on social media. If anybody has any um, suggestions of games or ideas they'd like me to make in a Simflare, leave them in the comments below or shoot me a message anywhere on social media. And everybody, I started a new podcast. It's called Board Games Outsider. I interview industry professionals about the jobs that they do and maybe have them give some tips and tricks and what they did to get the job. So that way, anybody that wants to do the job that they have, they have all the knowledge from somebody who does the job on actually how to get their job or, or a job that's just like it. So if that sounds interesting to you, check that out on any um, podcasting platform. That's Board Games Outsider. Hey, don't forget everybody, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Have fun, everybody. Spirit Island is a game of empowerment, collaboration, and spirits terrifying the ever-living crap out of invaders who dare step into their land. Not only is it one of my favorite cooperative games, but it's one of my favorite games of all time, period. And so I knew I had to have it on Rook and Record. This game has everything, staggeringly powerful and highly specific asymmetric powers, fantastic synergies, great artwork, layers upon layers of replayability, and a thematic core that portrays the island as terrifying and beautiful. So I knew that something this special needed something a little unconventional that honors both the Rube Goldbergian design and the, the game with its more elemental qualities. And after searching for a long time, I finally knew I had it. Now, hear me out, because the perfect soundtrack to pair with Spirit Island is 1981's Ghost in the Machine by The Police. While I do miss the proto-pop-punk sound of their early stuff, Ghost in the Machine is at a point when the police fully embrace their new wave moniker, introducing more otherworldly qualities in their already exotic blend of rock, reggae, and Middle Eastern rhythm-infused pop. The result is staggering, with Sting's haunting ethereal voice being contained in the primal, almost downright elemental beats of Stuart Copeland's incredible drumming, all the way grounded by solid pop rock riffs thanks to the fantastic Andy Summers. This is an album that no other three human beings could have made, and nothing has quite sounded like it or really the police since. But it's also that individuality of each musician that makes these guys such a compelling fit for Spirit Island. Like the spirits who work best as a team, each member of the police is unique in competition as much as they are in concert, and when they pull together, magic happens. And they never created magic with such seductive menace, primal, elemental, beautiful, and a little creepy as they did with a ghost in the machine. And so that's why, in spite of the contrast between the vibrant and natural and the digital and black, I think that Ghost in the Machine is the perfect soundtrack to listen to while playing Spirit Island. Thanks for watching the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record. I've been Jack, and remember, the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. This is Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is why it's there. We're take a look at a game in my collection and see why it's stuck around and why I enjoy it so much. So today I'm going to be taking a look at an extremely fast-paced fantasy game where you're doing area control, and that is Ethnos. Ethnos is a cute little area control game where you're trying to collect different sets of cards to be able to play them out and control the different areas. I love how quick playing and fast place Ethnos is. Basically, you only have a couple decisions. You can either take more cards by either getting ones that are out in the display in the middle or being able to take them off the top of the deck or you can choose to play out of Warband in your hand. When you're playing a Warband, they either all have to be the same fantasy race or they have to be of the same color. Um, the 
card that you put on the top of that warband shows the area on the board you're going to be like invading for the area control. And then at the end of each round, different players, depending on who has the most points, are going to be getting points in those different areas. It's a super simple game, super like fast paced as you're playing stuff back and forth. A round ends when the all three of the dragons come out. Everybody's just like collecting hands full of cards. They have a giant handful of cards that they're going to unload because you get more points the more cards you have of like a specific warband. So sometimes people try to save up so that they have a huge warband they can lay out to get a ton of points at the end of the round. But it's like a risk, like press your luck sort of thing as you're continuing to take cards and not playing your stuff out, trying to get something like super huge because if that third dragon comes up, then the entire round's over and all those cards you have are going to be wasted. I have had a blast playing this with my friends, super fast paced. It's one of those games where it's like you just want to play it like back to back over and over again just because like it's super fun. I feel like it's one that's almost been like lost to time. Like it only came out like a year ago. I don't hear as many people talking about it as there once were, but it's a super like fast paced theme that like replaces like the sort of ticket to ride thing where you're just like real quick getting these sets and then playing them out to do the things you need to do out on the board. I, I love like the fantasy theme and it's got like that old school Lord of the Rings artwork, even though like the board's all like crazy pastel and stuff like that, I still really enjoy the game. So Ethnos is a blast and it's definitely one that I'm going to keep around on my shelf and continue to play with my friends. So that's why it's there. Hi, welcome to Jules Reviews. I'm Julie. Today I'd like to talk to you about how we organize our game collection that we've been collecting over the past 20 years. The reason why we've organized our games the way we have is because I'm a two-time cancer survivor and due to the treatments I've been through, it has affected my endurance as well as my cognitive abilities, especially my memory. Um, there are certain games that I really like and can handle very well and other games that I want nothing to do with. This episode, I'm going to talk to you about the category of games that I really enjoy playing. Next episode, it'll be talking about the category of games that I usually try to avoid. If you happen to see any games next to me or behind me that you're interested in maybe learning more about and would like me to review, please leave a comment down below and I'll get to that as soon as I can. Right now, we're in front of my favorite shelf area. So the push your luck, dice, and tile game area. I enjoy these games the most because they're fun, they're quick and easy to play. I especially love the dice area because if you've seen our previous videos, you know that rolling dice is probably my most favorite thing to do. The other thing I love about this area is that a lot of these games take less than 30 minutes to play, which is really good for me because 30 minutes is about my limit. These four shelves here contain our two-player games as well as our deck building games. My husband and I play a lot of the two-player games because our sons are busy with work and school. We don't get to play as many family games as we used to. I like many of our deck building games because each time we play it, it's a different outcome. Some of the games that we have are too complicated for me to play, so I avoid them. Another section I like to go to is the cooperative and rummy section. I like the cooperative games because there are times I just don't want to play competitively. This section of contains the games that have many sequels and expansions. If we didn't enjoy playing them so much, we wouldn't have so many <laughs> expansions. My husband has put these up front for me as they are some of my most favorite game systems that I like. The last section I'd like to talk to you about is the most points in so many turns area. I enjoy these games because there's an end in sight. After so many turns, it's over, which is great because it means it won't drag on. Thanks so much for watching Joel's Reviews. I'm Julie. Have a great day. Hey, hey, welcome to Token Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is these totally geeky games, where I make recommendations of games for those geeky friends of ours with interests outside of our hobby. Our hobby being tabletop board and card games, and the interest this week being Disney animated movies. That's right. If you, yourself, or a friend of yours is a big geek for Disney animated movies, the ones that came out from the 50s all the way on to the 1990s, um, then the game that I have as a recommendation this week might be the game for you. 
and that game is Villainous. Villainous is a interesting uh, hand management card game where you play cards as a villain in a famous Disney animated movie, and you're trying to reach your own unique objective. This game is interactive, though, as other players at the table are assuming the characters of other villains from other Disney movies, and so you might be trying to also play cards on their boards to try to hinder them from reaching their objective. That's right, so if you're playing as Jafar, you're trying to reach your objective, but simultaneously other players at the table might be trying to play Aladdin cards on you to stop you from reaching your objective. And if there's another player at the table who's playing Ursula, you might be playing aerial cards on her to make her stop reaching her objective. That's the game. Um, kind of summed up really quickly. There's a lot of different types of cards, and the components in this game are really cool. So, I thought, why not just show it to you guys? So yeah, as I said, I thought I'd show you guys the game. So if you open the box, there's, of course, an instruction book. And each player, depending on the villain you play, gets your own player board. Uh, and so this is Ursula's unique objective, as well as a player board where she can select her actions. Kind of Scythe style. This game is kind of similar to Scythe in its main gameplay where you play cards. Uh, here's Prince John's board. Captain Hook. The Queen of Hearts. Um, and these cards, let's take a closer look. So this is the main crux of the game. These are the cards that you play to hinder your opponents. And these are the cards that you play to fulfill your objectives. So these are the cards that would help out Captain Hook. And if you look at, let's see, Ursula's cards, these are the hindering ones. If you look at Ursula's cards, you see they're different from Captain Hook. So each villain has their own specific kinds of cards. And I mentioned kind of Scythe. So you take these player pieces, this is if you're playing Ursula, and you... It's a really nice piece. Anyway, so, and then this is if you're playing uh, Jafar. Anyway, so you take these pieces and you put it on a section of your board, and those are the actions that you could take on your turn. This is if you're playing Queen of Hearts. And these, these player pieces are really nice components. That's why I wanted to show them off. This is Captain Hook, and you could see the, the player piece itself kind of looks like a sleeve, and there's a tidal wave for his hook. Um, this piece, let me get it out. This piece is, of course, uh, King John. Am I holding it upside down? I think I'm holding it upside down. No, maybe that's, well, it stands, stands up that way, so that's fine. And then this last piece, of course, is Maleficent. So you play as those villains, and that's the game. So that was the game Villainous, my recommendation of a game for any fans of Disney animated movies out there. Um... In the comments, tell me what other games that you would recommend to Disney animated movie fans. And what's your favorite Disney animated movie? Perhaps pre-Pixar. Um, go ahead and tell me that in the comments as well. Well, I'll see you on the next Token Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this has been These Totally Geeky Games. Bye. Hey folks, welcome back to another Just Missed It segment here on Token Punch Lunch. This is a segment where I take a game and I talk about how it just missed the mark of being something. Whether it be uh, a, a great game, which means that it's a good game and something that I would probably recommend, or all the way down to it missed the mark of being just a decent game and and you should probably steer clear of it so those that's kind of the spectrum that we're dealing with here on just missed it uh, but today we're talking about this guy right here broadhorns this is a game that's put out by rio grande games designed by james hudson and it is a game where you are taking a broadhorn a, a basically a raft or a barge that is built out of wood and you're taking it down the mississippi from st louis all the way down to new orleans and you you are trying to sell your wares. Uh, you have different kinds of commodities on board, like wheat and um, pork and furs and um, liquor and, and that type of stuff. And you're trying to sell those things at the different ports throughout the course of the, of the Mississippi River. And then you're also trying to pick up and deliver passengers from one city to the next. And you're, you're basically just trying to make money. And you're, you're trying to do that in a very efficient way uh, and the person at the end of the game who has the most money is the winner uh, 
And so here you have just briefly a look at the game and you can see that the board is rather picturesque. You have all of these different city tiles that have all of the different things that you can sell and the values for them. And uh, then you also have other tiles that have the ability to purchase things while you're there selling and there's bonuses that you can get, victory points that are worth at the end of the game. And uh, the board itself, if you look at it, is not you know beautiful or anything like that but it's functional it pops it's colorful and i like that as well uh so the different components of the game are really kind of what uh, drew me in and said hey this is something you should probably take a look at and so i did and i was interested but i mean i mean look at these things these are really neat as well the, all these little colorful barrels to represent fur and uh liquor and wheat and apples and so these are really nice components i like that it has a nice cloth bag that comes in there and of course these are just wooden player opponents uh player components the uh uh, wooden tokens for scoring your points and keeping track of your money and uh, these are just your little barges that are going to be sailing down the river here this is the first player token because everybody's going to be getting an equal number of turns throughout the game uh, this is the barges these are the barges that uh, you can use during the course and they're they're of course they're not beautifully designed but they're functional these is where all of your commodities will go this is uh some information that's pertinent to the uh, round and the expedition that you're going through and there's different sizes they're worth different amounts of money and and then that type of stuff and then of course you have the largest one here the the 40 foot broad horn uh so it, Again, this is something that I was looking forward to giving a try. Now, Rio Grande Games isn't, at least currently, isn't known for their mind-blowingly awesome-looking games. Uh, they have some decent games out there, yeah, but usually their artwork, at least in my experience, has been lackluster at best. And that's one of the things that turned me on to this, is that it looks good. It looks great. It doesn't look bland. It doesn't look boring. It looks like something that might be enjoyable. And so I was... My interest was peaked and I grabbed it off the shelf and we played it. Now I have to say that this is probably one of the most bland games that I've played recently. And I've played some stinkers here recently too. So uh, the theme on this one, while it was the one thing that kind of drew me in that said, hey, pick me, play me, um, that's the one that really is kind of the letdown here because this is basically just a lot of mechanisms wrapped around... Um, an interesting theme, but not done very well. One of the people that I played this game with had this to say about it. He said that it was terribly average. It just missed the mark because it just wasn't fun. It was bland. It was, as my opponent said, terribly average. So that's that for Broadhorns. It just missed the mark. We'll see you guys and gals. On the flip side, let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a Mare Thrash gaming for those of us who prefer to play alone. The start of the school year has really thrown me for a loop, and I've been so busy with work that I haven't had a lot of gaming time. But I want to talk about Roll and Rights today, because those are the games that are definitely letting me still play, even when I am busier than I ever thought I could be. Roll and Rights tend to be cheap. They tend to be easy to solo, because most of them offer little interaction, although I'll show you one that does. And um, they are very us they're usually very small, which means that they are very easy to slip into your bag to play on a lunch break, or when you are out having coffee, or just at any time during the day when you have a moment. I've even played one of these in a doctor's office when I was in the waiting room. So their convenience is just unparalleled for me. First, I'm going to show you my favorite of the lot, but also the most expensive, which is Metro X. This is a Japanese import, so it's going to run you about $37 on the sites that do sell it. However, this is a really fun game about filling in maps of the Japanese subway systems in Tokyo and Osaka, which is something that you wouldn't think would be that fun, but I have watched grown adults freak out about flipping the card that lets them finally complete a line, and it's amazing how addictive this game is. I love it. I play it on my own, I play it with my students, I play it with my friends, and I've never had a flat game. It's just really good. 
My favorite, more reasonably priced roll and write game is the Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. This one will only run you about $15 and it is so easy to play. You just open the box, pull out a sheet, a pencil and the dice and go to town. And it has a lot of that same addictive quality of the Castles of Burgundy, the card game, but without having nearly as much table hogging. It's just, you could pull it out anywhere. You could play it on an airplane and it will still give you that really good, puzzly, satisfying feeling of trying to fill up your estate and score points. I just think it's a really solid game. If you're looking for a decent roll and write that's really, really cheap, that's when you want Rolling America. This one's about $8 on Amazon, and it is a game where you are trying to fill in a map of the United States with numbers that you roll on the dice, but you are not allowed to put numbers next to each other that are more than one apart. So if you have a three, you can border it with a four or a two, but not a five or a one. So it's really simple. It's not the best of the lot in my opinion, but it's very entertaining and it's $8. Also, everything fits in this like one little box. You do have to provide your own pencil, but I mean, this is like pocket size. And Cosmic Run Rapid Fire is a roll and write game that I'm still getting to know a little bit. I played this as a two person game with my boyfriend and this is a very interesting roll and write in the sense that you can choose to play an aggressive game where you can actually attack the other player's ships. So all the roll and writes I've shown you before are no player interaction. Everybody looks at the same cards or dice, but they play their own game. In Cosmic Run, you're actually allowed to mess with the other players. There's a friendly version of the game where you don't have to do that, but you can also play a more aggressive version where you're trying to knock other people's ships out. And you are humans who are racing to get past space mines and other challenges to be the first to reach new planets in space. Uh, it's, it was really fun as a two-player game, and there is an, there's like a solo mode with an opponent that I actually haven't tried yet, so look out for a review soon. This one will run you about $20. So if you're like me, you want to get some gaming in, but your life is completely crazy right now, I highly recommend that you try a roll and write. They take very little time to learn, they take very little time to play, but you're going to find yourself wanting to play again because they're just so entertaining. Happy gaming. Well, hi, I'm Doug Jr. with Doug and Doug Gaming, and this is my daughter Brittany to help me today during this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. Well, in this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples, I want to talk to you about something that we're all going to have to do at some point, and that is teach somebody else how to play a game. Now, this can be a frustrating experience, so I'm going to give you 10 tips to help you teach a new game to somebody. Now, I've picked a game that we like to play in our game group, that is Black Orchestra, and I'll be talking about some of the mechanics in that game. For instance, in Black Orchestra, you have the option to do what is called Conspire. Now, this is uh, involving some dice that you can roll. You can use one, two, or three actions, and also one, two, or three dice, based on how many actions you want to take for that. You can roll them. Now, if you get the eagles, that's a bad thing. You're going to have to raise your suspicion. However, if you get the targets, then you can put that up in... What? Maybe I should just do this myself. So real quick, I want to give you 10 tips that I hope will help you when you're teaching games to someone who doesn't know the rules. Tip number one, be patient. You're going to need some patience because when somebody doesn't know what's going on, it's very confusing to them. And I'm sure we've all been there. You understand what it's like. So just plan now on having a little extra patience from the very get go. Tip number two. Make sure that you start out by explaining the theme, if there is a theme, and just let them know what universe you're in, what the idea is, what the concept is. Like in Black Orchestra, of course, we're trying to assassinate Hitler before the end of World War II. So make sure they know what the theme is, and that will help the gameplay to be more enjoyable for them. Tip number three, make sure that they understand the win and lose 
conditions right from the very get-go because once they understand that, they'll understand when you're teaching the other rules how this is going to help them accomplish that win or avoid that lose. So go ahead and explain the win and lose conditions right up front. Tip number four, be patient. No kidding, you're gonna need some patience, so just plan on it, be patient. So tip number five is please explain any gamer terms or game specific terms that might come up. Remember, if they're not a gamer, they don't know what a meeple is. They don't know the difference between a round and a turn necessarily. So make sure to explain these things as needed. Also, uh, game specific terms like in Black Orchestra, they use the word dossier. Well, that just means your hand. So just explain these things so that they can be on the same page with you. Tip number six. Be patient. Yes, I know, but really, you're, you're gonna need some patience. Tip number seven, and some of you may disagree with me on this, but only teach what's needed to get the game going. Now, some things are necessary. They need to know so that they can plan their strategy and you know make a, a decent plan of action, but other things can really wait until certain phases of the game. For instance, in the game Black Orchestra, um, you might end up in prison. Well. Until that happens, you really don't need to explain that. You can go ahead and start the game. Just tell them that, hey, if there's a Gestapo raid, you could end up in prison. And if it happens, and well, it will happen eventually, then go ahead and explain about interrogation cards and how other players can get you out. Uh, that's not really gonna affect their strategy. So I say get to playing just as soon as you can. If something can wait to be explained, go ahead and wait. Tip number eight, be patient. Yeah, I know I cheated, but I had to come up with 10 and I just didn't have them. Tip number nine, expect to be the answer person. In other words, they're gonna be asking questions during the explanation and they're gonna be asking questions during the game, at least during the beginning of the game. So just make up your mind right now that you're gonna be answering questions, that you're not gonna be able to totally concentrate on your gameplay because you're gonna to have to stop and answer their questions. Get that in mind so it won't frustrate you when it happens because it's probably gonna happen. And tip number 10, see tip number one. That's right, be patient. Seriously, just have some patience, roll with it and enjoy yourself. Remember, the reward is gonna be worth any frustrations that you might experience because you're drawing people into this gaming community that hopefully will stick around. Maybe you'll have a new friend out of the deal. Maybe you'll have a new gaming partner. Whatever the case, it's worth it. So enjoy yourself, enjoy spreading the good news about board gaming, and just have fun. Well, thank you so much for watching this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. Hopefully these tips will help you out so that you don't get too frustrated when you're teaching games. And we'll see you next time on Token Punch Lunch. Almost a Gamer. And I put together a list that may help you determine whether you are almost a gamer or a casual gamer. So here we go. Number one, you are more excited to bring a snack to game night than you are to bring an actual game. Game night is coming up, so we can make sticky buns. Ooh, we're getting a little too sticky. Some cookies. Mm. Ooh, a cake, a lemon cake. That sounds really good. Number two, you are not great at shuffling cards. You don't like to shuffle cards. And when other people see you shuffling their cards, they may ask you to stop. Number three, you feel that you do not have a need to learn a new game every time you get together with other gamers. You are perfectly happy to replay the games you already know. You don't have that craving for a new game like other gamers tend to. Number four, you have no idea what metagaming is, and that's okay with you. Number five, for a while there, you thought that abstract strategy had something to do with Jackson Pollock and home decor. Donna, what are you doing? Abstract strategy. Number six, you do not tally your games played on Board Game Geek. I mean, who's counting? 
Oh yeah, except all those other gamers out there. And number seven, and probably the most telling, after about two and a half hours of playing a game, your brain may stop working. Whose turn is it? Did we lose yet? Can you relate to any of the things on this list? If so, you may be almost a gamer or a casual gamer. Maybe you do relate to some, but you feel like you're a hardcore gamer. You don't want to be labeled. That's totally fine. This list was just for fun and just to kind of celebrate those more casual players that feel like maybe they don't know where they fit in. So just here to say you totally fit in. Thanks for watching and I hope everyone has a great day. A little side note on snacks. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but once or twice I have been snacking on like peanuts or pretzels at the table and I'll absentmindedly grab a game piece and put that in my mouth thinking it's a peanut or a snack. If this ever happens to you, just play it cool, take it out of your mouth, dry it off a little bit, back on the table, nothing ever happened. People don't take too kindly to other people eating their games, so just keep it on the down low and you'll be fine. Yours up and just look at it, you yourself. You're gonna say dude, and you're trying to match up with someone else and saying dude in the same way that you are. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> dude. 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 <laughs> dude. <laughs> Hey dudes and dudettes, it's Even Steven here. Today we're looking at the game Dude, another non gamer insight with Sarah and Haley. Let's get to it. Okay, everyone, let's see what Sarah thinks first. So Sarah, this is a game called Dude. So you have to say dude a bunch of different ways and then try to match other people that are saying it. So what did you like most about this game? I liked that you um, kind of had to wear a ton of different hats. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you would say dude, like kind of like a hippie. And then yeah. sometimes you'd ask dude mm -hmm. as a question. Yeah. Just kind of fun to yeah. play different roles. Yeah, um, it's fun to play with more people, I think, too, because then you'll match up more and there's just more chaos going around. Um, is there anything you didn't like about the game? Not really. I thought it was fun. Um, some of them were kind of hard, but I think that's the point of the game. Yeah. So it was, I would recommend it. Only only problems I could think of was like if you don't match up with someone, it's kind of like you just have to keep shuffling through your cards till you find someone to match up, but it's not too bad. Um, would you recommend this for people who don't play a lot of games? Yeah, I think this would be a fun party game for sure. Yeah, and it's got a cheap price point too, small, easy to carry. So that's Dude. Let's see what uh, Haley thinks. Okay, let's see what Haley thinks about Dude. So in this game, you have to match other people that are saying Dude in a bunch of different ways. What did you like most about this game? Um, I thought it was really challenging to kind of differentiate between the D-E-W-D mm -hmm. and the D-O-O-O-D-E. Yes. It was really difficult to kind of... I don't know, match up between the two, yeah. but it was really fun when you finally got it. It was like really exciting. Mm -hmm. It's fun because you have to really listen to the other person and mm -hmm. kind of know how they say things too. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you didn't like about Dude? I don't think so. Um, it was a good challenge. I, th I don't think there's anything I didn't Yeah, know. I mean, it's good. It's kind of relaxing. Mm -hmm. Easy rules. You can play with a lot of people. I laughed so. a lot. <laughs> yeah, you laughed a lot. That's good. Um, so, would you recommend this to people who don't play a lot of games? I definitely would. This is another one of those games that's like a good transition into getting into yeah. games. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's really no challenge associated with yeah. it. It's just kind of simple and the directions aren't difficult. And exactly. There's you like, can do it while you're paying attention or not. It's yeah. good first game. A couple game. rules and it's just fun to yeah. play with a lot of people and it's definitely. quick. So, okay, that's Haley's thoughts. Let's get to the final ending. Okay, everyone, those were their thoughts on Dude the Game. We'll see you next time, dudes and dudettes. Oh. Steven, why do you ask it like a question? I did. Dude. Mm. <laughs> Sound like a goat. Oh. <laughs> Steven, you're ruining it. Dude. 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 <laughs> Sweet. Sarah is the winner. <laughs> Um, I like cowboy. How do you do cowboy, dude? 
Dude. Well, dude. 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 Yeah, should we be like, zoom, zoom, zoom. Dropping the hottest mixtape. <laughs> Can you, can you like slop? Did you record that? Yeah, it's recording. I want to see that playback. <laughs> You'll see it, it in the outtake. You may not have done that. Shaylee. You gotta do it in one take. You realize that. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so in Haley, oh man, I messed up. <laughs> that was you. Yeah. <laughs> it was her fault. She's sister. She's laughing. And... All right. Let's that was not time. my fault. Two, I'm sorry. That was not my She's fault. Sabotaging. She is on Three. purpose. I would have. <laughs> <laughs> it lasts like point two <laughs> seconds, and you're like, Sarah, "That's because that's I was my looking. intro. Get <laughs> out of here." Sarah, I wasn't ready. Okay, I promise I'll be good up here. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Stop! I can't do it. Can't. Well, but that already is we in our no thing. No say. And what's we more? already did that though. Cry thing. me a river. You have a. Turn your face that way. You have like what? a whisker. I don't know if it's attached. It's definitely attached. There's a snake in my okay, mood. intro. Hey, dudes and dudettes. We're Hope you're enjoying your lunch. Mine's actually cooking in the oven downstairs, uh, funny enough. Mmm, lovely. This is a starting tile though, not a cookery show, about gateway games where you can choose one of these games that I talk about to introduce your friends, family into the hobby, and hopefully they're different from the usual Catan ticket to ride and carcassonne stuff that you see on every top 10 gateway games list. With good reason, but still, you want choice, don't you? So today, this is a bit of an unusual one. All the games that I have shown before have been ones that you can buy and play again and again and again. This one you can't, at least not unless you buy multiple of them. I'm talking about Exit, and this Exit, and this Exit, and this Exit. Yeah, these are four that I haven't got through yet. They're still in shrink wrap, but I've played all the other ones in this series. Exit is basically, well, let's use this one actually. Exit is one of those games that is based on escape rooms. They're all the rage now, everybody's talking about them, and I've been in a few live ones, and they are great fun. You basically go into a room, you're locked in, and you have to solve a series of riddles and puzzles in order to unlock various safes and walls and cabinets in order to actually get out. It's basically, like you say in the title, Escape the Room. They're great fun to do though, not the cheapest hobby in the world, but you do have an alternative with these exit games. These, however, are destructible. You are pretty much cutting these up and drawing all over them and doing all sorts of them. So once you've used it, that's it. You can never use this one again. Once I take this out of the shrink wrap, it's in the bin as soon as I've done playing it. But they are great fun because like in those rooms, you are given the booklet, a scenario, and then you have lots of little riddles and puzzles to solve. You and anybody else you want to bring into the, into the game can just work as a team. You will time yourself, you'll have hint cards that give you, you know, tips on trying to solve each riddle if you get stuck, but the less of them you use, the higher your star rating at the end. And that's pretty much what these are. They are basically little escape rooms in a box. They cost about sort of 10 to 12 pounds a piece, you know, not too expensive, but you've got to accept that it's one play and you're done. So what more can I say about it? Well, let's turn to my easy rating and find out. E for ease of play. They're pretty straightforward. Not to actually solve the riddles, they're pretty tricky in some cases. They have a difficulty rating to say whether they are for novices or experts, and believe me, even a novice one can uh, throw you through a loop at times, but the hard ones, like this one that I've heard about, yeah, they will tax your brain a lot. But that's a good thing. If you like puzzles, that's great. In terms of the rules, dirt simple. One read of one of the rule books and you're, and you're away within about 10 minutes. And then every time you play one of these again, it's the exact same premise. So once you've played one, you can play the rest really easily. A for aesthetics. Now, aesthetics is not something that you can rank highly with something like this, particularly when you're destroying it. The components are fine though. You get a little booklet usually full of stuff. You get some additional little components, you know, that are just made out of cardboard or plastic. We're not talking stellar production here, but then the game costs about a tenner. That's not exactly bad going, is it? You know, so yeah, don't expect fancy artwork or fancy components. Just expect what you need in order to do a puzzle game. 
And then S for scalability. Now this one's a little bit more touch and go because I tend to play these solo and they work fantastically as a solo game. However, they can work just as well with two, probably max three players. Because what you don't want to happen is if you play this with four or more, nobody, there are some people who won't have anything to do. You know, there's a booklet, there's some puzzles, people could be working on maybe one or two puzzles at a time, but then that's about it. After that, you're kind of, some people might be sat there not doing much. So it scales okay. Don't expect to play this with a family of four, at least not too often, but four is probably the absolute max. Three and less though, even solo, and this is a surefire hit. And then finally, the wider yawn factor. You're not gonna be yawning when you play this game. You might be yawning after you finish because it will tax your brain so much that you'll be tired and you feel like you need a rest. But now, once you get started on these ones, they're very engaging, they're, they're, your brain is constantly in motion, constantly trying to figure out these puzzles, either frustration that you can't figure it out, or your self-fulfillment that you've solved this expert puzzle and you didn't need a single hint. So they tend to work fine, and as you can see, I've got four of these to get through, and it's not like they're getting bored anytime soon. So that's the exit games. Thank you for checking out this starting tile episode. If you like what you see, then by all means, give me some feedback, subscribe to my channel, and I am starting to run out of games to talk about on this channel. So if you've got any feedback about how to develop this starting tile segment, please let me know. Kind of need some help here, guys. Anyway, that's it from me. I'm off to have my dinner. Hope you're enjoying your sandwich or pasta or whatever it is you're having for lunch. Take care. And I'll see you on the next episode. And remember, these, however destructible they are, are still only games. Take care. So that's that for another episode of Token Punch Lunch. I certainly hope that everybody enjoyed themselves. And uh, that is why we're doing this. So that we can inform and entertain you, hopefully in a delightful way. Well, I hope that uh, you'll make plans to join us here back in a couple of weeks when another episode will air. And I want to thank all of my contributors for putting in all the hard work that they do. This is not their day job. And so they take a lot of, uh, it's a labor of love, I guess you could say. Uh, and it's a labor of their hobby. They enjoy doing this and they enjoy providing content for you guys and gals. So uh, please take time in the comment section to thank them if you enjoyed their segment. And uh, that's it from us. We're going to go ahead and get on out of here. We'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. Take care now.